What's up, everybody? Welcome on into a new show, One Nation. Annie Petrillo, Jordan Wilson. That's right. We're going to be the two taking you through 30 minutes of all Canadian soccer. We're really excited about this. Super this shows, excited. Yeah, it's going to be right here on One Soccer. You can catch it on the YouTube channels. I'm pretty sure we're going to be putting clips out on Twitter as well because we will be saying things of absolute brilliance. I think Jordo. so. You think so? I but I also want to talk. I know the the name One Nation is out, but like for me, I've just been thinking about. Oh, you're not letting this go. This. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, I, honestly, I was thinking about. It. I was like, trails and wills. I was like, ooh, ooh. Spinderella and the handsome fella. Oh, was the one that, I'm like drive that home, baby. That could be the show. All right. <laughs> so this well, is Spinderella for those who don't know. Well, people need to know because we were talking Salt and Pepper, and I said people show don't. some respect for the DJ Spinderella, hence why the nickname. And people don't know that you're an undercover gangster. And so I, like, <laughs> literally, I thought you were gonna listen to like some jazz and whatnot. No, straight hip hop. Yes. Your '90s head. Yes. Perfect. Andy Pacillo. There we go. Gentlemen. I felt though we needed to say where the Spinderella nickname came from yeah. because you do call me that quite a bit steady now you know there it but is. you're not gonna let it go you yeah you, you're like i want some but here's the thing it can be one nation with there it is spinderella and the handsome or fella or trills and wills i think trills. that's nice i like it i like it and here's the thing right sometimes it'll be you and me for 30 minutes because we just want to take the spotlight for ourselves sometimes sure. we're going to have guests on the show we are going to have a guest on the show today uh, josh cloak from the athletic because it's our first show, and as much as we want to have, you know, laughs and, and, you know, talk about light things and, and get ready for even, the, you know, the talk of the Canadian Premier League and the women are playing in the She Believes Cup and the men are coming up in the Nations League, there's a lot to be excited about from a Canadian soccer perspective. But at the same time, there's a lot to be sad about yeah. because the players aren't happy. And that doesn't make us happy. That doesn't make anybody happy. And over the weekend, we know that the Canadian women came out with their statement. They were very upset to learn about budget cuts, especially in a World Cup year. They also fear, uh, feel that there is unfairness there because last year it was the Men's World Cup. No budget cuts, you know, announced there. And the men came out with their own statement as well, showing support for the women and their fight. Clearly, they're not happy either about budget cuts. And we'll get into as well the Canadian Premier League. That was something that was mentioned more so in the men's statement. And we know that the women are also playing the She Believes Cup under protest, Jordo. Bottom line, like that's that's what's going on. And I mean, we're, tr we're all trying to digest everything that's going on. The women have said it's not just about compensation and money, although that's a, a big thing, you know, for them. It is about equality yeah. and it is about fairness. And how do you wrap your head around everything that came out over the weekend? Crazy weekend. Um, the most I've been like glued to my phone, looking at updates and seeing things. I was just like, oh my goodness. But I, a sentence in the, the woman's statement that stuck with me and just kind of put things into perspective was, enough was enough like a long time ago. And like for me, that just screams, you know, I love an analogy, Trills. You do. And if you tell your partner, husband, wife, whoever it might be, like this needs to, this needs to change or I'm walking or I'm, I, we're just not connecting. And this goes on for months, years, decades, where there's just like a bit of a disconnect. You can't be surprised if you come home one day and then your underwear is just in the neighbor's trees. <laughs> or... <laughs> yeah. If you come home and someone's not there, right? Like at a point, like enough is enough. So. I don't want to dive too much into things, but I just want to say that like there needs to be a something that needs to be said between both parties, and and, and transparency needs to be had. Nah, 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 dive into it, but but that's the thing. At the end of the day, people want transparency, which also, aka, people want the truth. People want to know what's going on because it obviously affects them. Yeah. And I think we can agree. You can agree, even as I mean, you you are fresh, fresh. into retirement, right? Fresh. Like you you still have one boot on. Right. Like, up. yeah, you're, you're still there. So as a player, especially when decisions are being made up here, they do trickle down and affect you. Agreed. You want transparency. You want the truth. I think we can understand where the frustration is coming from with the players. A, a thousand percent. I mean, once a player, always a player. You feel as you play your best when you know that you're appreciated. You play your best that when you know everything's taken care of off the pitch. Um, I can't imagine the, the women going into the She Believes Cup with this on their shoulders, like you're, you're not thinking about football, you're not thinking about performing. Um, so yeah, there's just a, there's a lot to unpack and I just think that we need to come to a common ground. How that looks, I don't know, but like I think we need to be open for a discussion and, and hearing both sides out and coming to some sort of common ground. Yeah, and I think at least for me, um, 
as a lover of the Canadian game for decades, you know, you as well, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm speaking on your behalf too, and you actually played it. Uh, you know, this, you want to see a resolution. You want to see it because you want to see a great product on the pitch. And we have been seeing a great product. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. Both of these national teams have been growing. The men in particular, for sure. we've recently seen growth. The women have been good for the better part of a decade now. Yeah. And I think it's understandable for a lot of people to scratch their heads and go, how do you qualify for a World Cup for the first time in 36 years? Oh, and by the way, um, you, you, you qualify and you do so tops of CONCACAF. How do you win an Olympic gold? And then there's the announcement of budget cuts. Yeah. So if I were to look at this completely objectively and I'd look and I go, okay, do budget cuts in some ways make sense? All right, you're still coming out of pandemic, which meant zero registrations, right? Yeah. Think about it. Like, that was literally Benzo, zero money sure. coming in. So I don't, you know, 2020, 2021, like very, you know, little to no money coming on in. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, I guess that kind of in some way makes sense. And then you had to spend a ton of money For sure. to travel the men during a qualification year. And by the way, let's not forget the men couldn't play at home because of COVID restrictions. So home games, you know, mm -hmm. were being played in the States. They didn't play at home until September. Yeah. So there, there's the money of having to send them out. Not, money's not coming in and you're paying to send the guys out. Paying, you know, women with the Olympics as well. So there's a part of me that understands that. Then there's another part of me that goes, but I can't let you off the hook. Absolutely not. Do you know what I mean? Like I can't let you off the hook. The merchandise, you gotta do better. Sell that, you know, um, COVID restrictions over. Find more ways to have home games. Ticket revenue matters, you know? Yeah. Like there are so many ways that money can come in that I'm like, uh, but I'm not going to let you off the hook completely. And it's a pivotal moment, like you said, Andy. Like right now, the men, they're on a wave. They're catching a buzz. But also just like the women have been balling for years. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's something, that's why that, that sentence stuck out to me because it feels as if, for years, things weren't explained, or I guess the money part of it, like it wasn't, it wasn't allocated maybe where it should be. Like it just needs to be talked about. Um, there needs to be just more transparency with it. Because if you have people working in any system, and they don't know where things are, where things lie, I think I think what would would have been nice is years back if they were just broken down and said, hey, this is what's happening, and and players just want to be in the know how. I know for me playing. Even with like simple things as a training session, you want your coach to come in and be like, hey, this is what we're going to do today. Or, hey, this is what you're doing. No one ever wants to have like the rug pulled from under them mm -mm. or just not be in the know-how about decisions made about your future or your life. So, again, transparency is what I'm hitting home in terms of just like having conversations and also maybe writing wrongs for conversations that should have been had three, four years ago, a decade ago. I think that the, the bread needs to be broken and mm. we definitely need to move in the right direction because this is the this is the era now. This is the time. Our women's team so competitive. This is a World Cup I think Canada could take. Like this is like something I could say like with my chest held high. I'm like Canada could go and do well, get to a semifinal, get to a finals. Absolutely. But like taking care of these details, you don't want five months in advance all the ladies mm -mm. feeling undervalued, unappreciated, and and protesting five months before a World Cup that could put them in such a different a different place. Yeah, because I think what you know a, a reminder a lot of too what's what's bothering the women is the treatment, right? They feel like the men get certain things, they don't. And that's been there for years. Yeah. So it's. It's emotional, yes, it's, there are facts to it, but it is emotional. It is like, hey, for the past 20, 25 years, we haven't been respected the same as men in the sport. And then when you get to the finer details, mm -hmm. right now they're like, well, if you can't notice us now, this is what we're gonna do. Yeah, it, it, there's a, and it is worth noting that the Minister of Sport of Canada, Pascal Saint-Ange, uh, has come out and said that she is going to be contacting both parties. Um, as of the taping of this, I don't know if, if she has. I, I do believe there has been um, some sort of contact made over the weekend because we know that the women's team, obviously, in the CSA did meet in Orlando just before they get set for the She Believes Cup. So we do know that the Minister of Sport is now going to contact them. There is a possibility when we're talking about monies here being looked into and the reason why the government can step in is because we do know Canada Soccer does receive government funding. We also know that because of the success of the women, there has been money that's been given to the CSA from Own the Podium, mm. which is strictly given to Olympians. Like that is money that should be used yeah. for the Olympians, which is something the women have qualified for all the time. They are the two-time bronze medalists, followed by the gold medal recently in Tokyo. And the women are asking, where did that money go? That comes back to your 
argument of transparency. Yeah. Right. So that's a big one, too. And the government, you know, like there there are steps that can be taken for them to look into that. So we do hope that soon transparency is there. Agreed. Because I don't know, man, the government don't be looking into my taxes. <laughs> I don't I don't like the government getting involved in anything. Absolutely not. No chance. <laughs> this is not what we want. Um. So the men obviously come out and it's, you know, it's great to see that the two programs are on the same page in showing support for one another. The men are there. They understand they want the women to have equal access yeah. and equal rights to things within Canada soccer. But there was a line there that I think uh, ruffled a lot of feathers and made people bristle. You played in the Canadian Premier League. I did. You, do, you did so proudly. We here at One Soccer take a lot of pride in covering that league, because we also understand the importance of a domestic league, which is another reason why we want to get the message out of why it's so important for the women to have a domestic league. Yes. The men seem to have dismissed it by calling it a minor league. Mm -hmm. um, because again, we're talking about funding here and, and, and CSB, and they feel that, you know, why is, is money that's being brought in from broadcasting dollars and sponsorship dollars, why is it being used to support a minor league? Ah. Uh. How did that make you feel? Ignorant statement. I mean, a lot was going on this weekend, but that's an ignorant statement. And why? I'll, I'll expand on that because this league, CPL, is not perfect. Cool. But it's in its infancy. Mm -hmm. MLS, when it started in 1996, Oof. yeah, they had 10 teams. Mm. Pay was not great. And it started, you look at the MLS now, 25 years or over 25 years later, flourishing in, in its own right, having attractive players come into league, whatever it might be. If you're Canadian, if you've watched this game, you know I gotta look at the camera. If you've digested the game in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. you know that you need a league. Project A as well, you know you need it for the women. You know you need something where guys can go and grow up, women can grow and grow up and play in a league and get better. And people always think, oh, like a league, like it's, it's not gonna be as great as MLS. You know what a league does? It provides opportunity. Ask a Drew Becky, Mason Trafford, Jamar Dixon, and the most handsome of them all, Jordan Wilson. <laughs> you ask them what this league can do, and it's just like, it gets you into another place as well. Life after football, which is the biggest thing. No matter how you spin it, no matter how long you play, if you're a Christine Sinclair, if you have a good and healthy life, you're gonna be out of football longer than you're in it. You'll play maybe 20 years if you're lucky, right? If you're, if, well, if you're beyond lucky. If, you're, if you have Christine Sinclair legs, you'll play for a 20 year season. But you'll still have to figure out what you're doing once you're 40 and whatnot, right? This is what this league can do. So like to say it's a minor league, it's you call it a minor league and it has major upside. Yeah. This is what the CPL does. For me personally, I'll back it till I die because it allowed me to transition to come home. I played for two years in front of my family, all of my loved ones, and now I'm able to be with, come on, the Spinderella, Trillo. No, <laughs> but this is what it does. It can connect and unite. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's just a, it's a backhanded compliment. And I'll also quote, my boy, Wheels, yes, he is my boy. I love him dearly. He says in Canada, sometimes we eat our own. And I, I also want to comment on this because I think for the men, their point could have came across just as, as good mm -hmm. without saying that little backhanded compliment. Like, I totally back everything that you want to say. If you feel unappreciated, if you feel like you need to say something, cool. But don't go and talk about a league that many of your players have expressed would have been crucial for them growing up. There you go, where, yeah. Like, it, it's a no-brainer. It's, it's something that you can't really deny. This league is in place. Even though you're not making millions of dollars and you're not rich, it, it provides your opportunity, a career, and then potentially a career after. So yeah. it, it was silly for me. It's also worth noting that in order for Canada to make a bid for 2026 World Cup, right, part of the stipulation from FIFA is you have to have a domestic league. You always come with the facts. So sure. that's, just, that's just fact. So the men had to have also a domestic league. And to your point, it's not just about the players. It's about coaches, refereeing, bringing people through. To your point, Drew Becky, Janine Becky's brother, making it, you know, playing in, in it. Uh, you know, Stefan Eustachio's brother is, sure. is coaching in it. Uh, Sam Atacubi's brother, Elijah Atacubi, plays in it. So there are players on the national team. Uh, Julia Grosso, right? We also know she's been very open about her, you know, um, uh, Joel Waterman. For sure. And, you know, dating her sister. Like, there are so many connections between both the men's and women's national teams who have family members yeah. making a career in the Canadian Premier League. Uh, we have our first guest on our first Woo! episode of One Nation, Josh Cloak of The Athletic. You get the honor, my friend, of being the first ever guest here on our show. You're with Andy and Jordan. What's going on, my friend? 
I mean, I thought I, I was under the assumption that I was coming on to hear how much you've changed your opinion on pineapple on pizza. That's what, that was in the contract. Don't make Wait, me hang on, up on. on you immediately. Jo Josh, I'm new to the party. What's what's the consensus he on wants, pineapple? On there pizza? is no con the consensus from every, uh, you know, people born in Italy to being first generation Canadian, oh, that Italian. The, okay. uh, it's a no, no. It's okay. just a no, no. But. Sorry, I, I, I'm Sorry, just, no, I just, hey, I just want to say, but are you Canadian? So is there a chance that maybe you might like the pineapple on pizza and just like enjoy it here? Or are you like super Italia like and like is, you're um, never gonna, you're never gonna not have. It's a conversation that we can take to the party. I have, uh, I, I'm with you, Josh. I know we've never met, but like pineapple on pizza is elite. And I think that you should try it, Andy. Petrillo's, Petrillo's just never tried my pineapple on pizza. What you got to do, Petrillo, now that we're talking about it, which we always should be, we got to grill that pineapple first. We got to throw on some jalapenos Gosh. to balance out that that's that sweetness. So um, again, this is why I was told I was coming on. I don't know if there's any <laughs> soccer news we want to cover. Or, I don't know. You know, I do appreciate the grilled pineapple. Maybe that's what it is. Anyone who just like dumps the pineapple out of a can and puts it on top of their pizza, no, go not. to jail. Just go straight to jail. Don't collect 200. <laughs> go straight to jail. Um, Josh, obviously, you know, th th this is a show where we do love to have fun here. But at the end of the day, it is, you know, a big topic that came out of the weekend with both national teams expressing real disappointment with budget cuts. You know, for Canada soccer moving forward, being able to grow the program, uh, there's a there's a lot of discontent there uh, between the two sides. The women, of course, the most vocal because they're the ones who are in a World Cup year. They're the ones who you know are getting set to play in a tournament here, and doing so under protest. That uh, that is what they've said. What's the latest, maybe that you've also heard? What what are you hearing from either side? Yeah, a lot of the reporting that I did on the weekend was was based around the men's side, just because that's the nature of my job. We have very talented reporters, you know, at the Athletic with the women's team. But I spoke to a number of men's national team players on Friday night, um, and I think the frustration that they have stems far beyond the statement they released. Um, in terms of that number, of the cuts. One player told me that he expects those those cuts to the national team programs to be just under fifty percent. Right. So half of the resources that the men and the women were working with in 2022, they're now working with in 2023. So, look, the both the men and the women have not been happy with Canada soccer because they don't have contracts in place. That That's huge. Right. You, you're going. You, 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 the men played in the World Cup without a contract. The women now appear ready to go to their own World Cup without a contract in place. So the frustration stems, you know, far beyond the statements that we saw. And I also think that this is not new frustration in any sense. You talk to, you know, past women's and men's national teams players. They've been frustrated with the way Canada soccer has kind of nickeled and dime players um, for a very long time. And I think the kind of gravitas of the whole situation now comes with the fact that the men's team went to the world cup for the first time in 36 years, the women are Olympic gold medal champions, and they've earned the right to bring these frustrations to a much wider audience. And I think that's why that's become this big story that it is now. And this is where I kind of get frustrated too. And I'm sure you are as well, Josh is because from one side, you hear that an, an offer has been tabled and they're just waiting on the players to get back to them. On the other side, you're hearing the players are like, well, here's what we've given back. We're waiting to hear from them. And then also, then we're hearing nothing can be done until the FIFA bonuses get paid out, which we know get paid out in March. I mean, where's the truth in the middle of this hurricane of the he said, she said? Yeah, I mean, the truth is usually always somewhere in the middle. Um, but I think, again, to, to keep with the, the theme of frustration, I think there's a lot of people frustrated that, you know, there's probably truth on some side, there's truth on another side, but we haven't heard from one side a lot, and that's Canada soccer. Uh, we had some real kind of, I guess we can call them vitriolic statements from some of the players, particularly the women's players. Um, and I want to talk in a little bit about you know, which players in particular were, were very front facing. But what we haven't seen a lot of um, is Canada soccer and some of, you know, the, the people at the top of, of Canada soccer to literally just, I guess, explain their side of the story. 
Right now, the optics of this whole situation look terrible for Canada soccer. And I genuinely think there needs to be a little bit more leadership in the form of, you know, some of these leaders being a little bit more front facing, getting out of the cameras, getting out in front of the cameras and not having kind of hastily organized press conferences. You know, the last one I can think about in, in Vancouver after the men's team went on strike, you know, not a podcast appearance here and there, but getting out, explaining the realities of, you know, the CSB deal, explaining the realities of the finances um, that this organization is working with. Because right now, I think if you were to take a poll of public sentiment, I mean, what would the estimate be in terms of who's on the player's side? 99% of, of Canadian soccer fans. Mm-hmm. Um and that's not to say that there's, you know, I'm, I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but I, I, I'm simply saying that I think we need to hear a lot more from Canada soccer leadership. Um, you know, I understand they don't want to be bargaining through the media, dealing, you know, through the media, and that's fair. Um, so perhaps part of that is just getting out and literally explaining to people that don't know. There's still, like, there's still, like you said, Andy, we're kind of in a search for the truth here. Um, and that's not to say that anything that Canada Soccer said will be taken completely at face value, but real leaders kind of step up and show themselves when times are tough. And I think this is about as low as negotiations or relations, I should say, between Canada Soccer and the players have kind of sunk. We need to hear from more than just the players on this. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling on that? It's fair. He, Josh is a, is a smart man. He's talking about pineapple on pizza, but then also... <laughs> <laughs> it's just about transparency, right? Like, this is where we're at. You can't have an argument or a one-sided uh, discussion and the other side's not speaking. Like, this is, yeah. that's the only way that this is going to get resolved. And I would just say at a crucial time. Like, it needs to get resolved sooner rather than later. It should have been resolved yesterday. So. Where, where do you know um, about where the negotiations stand? Are, are you privy to any of that, Josh, about where the men are? Because something else that we've heard is that the women's deal is close to being done. At least, again, where's the truth in all this, right? That the women were close to being done, but after the World Cup, you know, the men, they all go back to their teams. Uh, they did get representation now, but yeah. it sounds like it has stalled on the men's side. And I guess what's, what's very important to point out, Josh, is that when it comes to equal pay, the women now are no longer just negotiating with Canada Soccer, right? They're also now having to get on board with the men, and they all have to come to an agreement that things are going to be split equally. Am I, am I not right on that, right? So now we're also, are we, are we waiting for the men to figure out their contract in order for the women's deal to get done? Well, there's two things here. You know, let's go back to June 2022 when the men went on strike and they released a statement without any legal counsel. Uh, my understanding of that was just kind of driven by a very small group of players that had kind of learned about the CSB deal and were quite frustrated about it. And again, the word I used before, it was kind of hastily organized. Um, and we didn't really hear from a lot of players either. And you had the women's team kind of saying, well, hold on a sec now. Um, they almost wanted to distance themselves in a little bit from that. Now what's interesting is the men and the women seem to be working in concert, right? And, and the players that I spoke to on the weekend and people around the team that I spoke to on the weekend agree. There is an effort for the men and women to work together more to kind of achieve a mutual goal here. Um, but the word that I heard from a few players to describe the state of negotiation, specifically with the men's team association and Canada soccer as of late is static. The negotiations, we don't want to say they've broken down, but they've slowed to a point, um, I guess, to a crawl. And the thing that I kept hearing um, from people around the men's team that I spoke to on the weekend was that when, you know, when the men's team would maybe move off their proposal a little bit, maybe come down, I guess, if we're speaking very generally from some of the numbers, what they would hear back from Canada soccer. And again, what I'm telling you is just what players told me. That's all. Um, is that a lot of the, the 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 content in the new proposals remain the same, but it was just worded differently. So I think players feel frustrated in that perhaps there's not as much bargaining in good faith as as they would hope. You know, the players are sorry, Canada Soccer again. I need to be clear here. This is just according to the players. Uh, they feel like they're just they're not there's not enough of an effort to work to to meet in the middle. Um, you know, it's a negotiation tactic. Um, and again, this is focused more on the men's side. There doesn't seem to be the same sense of urgency that they have, 
compared to the women. Um, so I, I think that's probably where the men's team are in negotiations right now. Well, obviously, we know the women had the meeting on the weekend in Orlando. And, you know, what we heard right away is that Canada soccer was threatening to, to sue the players if they went on strike. And this, to me, was about as low as it got, right? You have Christine Sinclair, and this is an important point here. Christine Sinclair, who, for my money, is the best athlete to perform in a Canadian jersey. She's not necessarily the best Canadian athlete ever, but you look at what she's done in a Canadian jersey. I don't know how many other athletes across all sports can com- you know can compare. You have her coming out and saying, I can't essentially in good conscience continue to represent Canada. How low have things must have sunk for the players to have Christine Sinclair, who's never the most vocal of, exactly. of people at, at the best of times to say that. So I, it feels like things are a lot more urgent um, on the women's side. Um, and, you know, rightfully so. They have a World Cup right around the corner. Hey, Josh, how how hopeful do you feel that things can be resolved in the next, I'd say, couple months? Like, from, from talking to with the men, how do you feel just in terms of the women's team going to the World Cup in the summer? How hopeful do you feel that things can be resolved? I'm a lot more hopeful of getting Petrillo to try pineapple on pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, so you're saying good. there's not going to be a deal. Not there's, not good, dude. there's a chance. <laughs> it's a chance. Yeah, look, what has stuck out to me as well from both the men and the women's side is the calls for new leadership. And that's like, you're not, you're not, both the men and the women are not saying we need a new deal. This is again, what the players are saying. They've lost a lot of faith in leadership. That's really, really difficult, Mm -hmm. right? That's a difficult hurdle to overcome. Um, uh, And and I, as my understanding too, is, you know, for a lot of leaders, there's, there's only so much they can say. A lot of it is just bound in legal terms. And there's, 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 you know, I think, for Canada soccer, they're 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 working with what they can work with. Um, so, I was a I was not optimistic about them getting a, the men getting a deal before the World Cup. It was very, very close. But the more I kind of learned about um, a how far away they they might be, the men might be in a deal, and b just how frustrated they've become. Um, that's why I'm I'm a lot less optimistic. You know. It's it, the women. I I, I really I, I I can see why they're doing what they're doing because the She Believes Cup, you know, is an invitational tournament, right? So they're not going to have you know if if they were to go on strike, they wouldn't incur the kind of serious fines that they might if it were kind of a FIFA sanctioned regulated tournament like the upcoming Concacaf Nations League is going to be for the men. Uh, my understanding is the men have not discussed kind of going on strike ahead of March at all. Uh, but how could it not be, you know, the first thing they're asked about when they kind of get together in March, right? So I'm not optimistic. This just feels like something that's going to continue to drag. And, you know, nobody in Canada soccer wants, nobody in Canadian soccer wants to see that. Not at all. Josh, really appreciate you taking the time to come on. It's great having you on as our first guest here on One Nation. Thank you, Josh. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And uh, again, the invitation is open anytime, Andy. Yep, you'll just be sitting on that for a little while longer. That is Josh <laughs> Cloak from The Athletic. Some great stuff. Be sure to follow him, uh, You know, read his articles. He's always on the ball when it comes to stuff going on in Canadian soccer. I do want to just say this, Giorgio, um, because again, there's a lot of confusion because of the lack of transparency. And I just want to say as somebody who's been with you know One Soccer now going into five years, I can't speak on behalf of the CSA. can't speak on behalf of the players. I can't speak on behalf of CSB. All I can speak on behalf of is One Soccer, who is owned by Media Pro, operated by Media Pro, who is a business partner of CSB. But what we do here is we broadcast, like never before, Canadian soccer. From CPL to the national teams to every single game, it is not missed. And we do that with so much pride because we love this game and we want to see it get attention. We want the players to get their due. We want it to grow. That is all I can speak on behalf of, is what we do here, the work we do here at One Soccer, and how much that means to us. And I hope you felt that as a CPL player. Absolutely, I did. And now we brought you on board. Look at that. It's because of you. It actually all started with you, Andy. So That's a story it. we'll share for another day, because <laughs> this show is a weekly show. 
So, we, you know, we're going to talk soccer, but we might spill the tea on a little bit of things too. Jordan Wilson, Andy Petrillo. Thank you, Josh Clover. This is One Nation on One Soccer.